Welcome to Fifth Sunday at Citadel of Faith, ladies and gentlemen. This is your church administrator, Sean Bolton, and these are your announcements for Sunday, January 31st through Saturday, February 6th, 2021. Our theme for 2021 is No More Business as Usual, taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. Midweek worship service. This Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m., Superintendent Dr. Pamela S. Jackson is the preacher. We hope you will tune in to Facebook Live at Citadel Faith, to our website at www.citadeloffaith.net to our live stream, or join in via phone to hear the message by calling 712-770-5505. The access code is 548-514. Followed by the pound sign. Technology is allowing us to stay engaged as a church family, so let's utilize what we have to stay connected. School of Discipleship will be held via Zoom, Facebook Live at Citadel Faith, and on the website at www.citadelfaith.net on Thursdays at 7 o'clock p.m. United Cornerstone University's winter quarter will begin on this Saturday, February 6th. All classes will be held virtually. Please visit the university's website at www.ucuedu.com for course offerings and for registration information. Join us for Open Door Prayer Ministry every Wednesday at 6 o'clock a.m., led by Elder Christine Michael. The call-in number is 712-770-5505. The access code is 548-514, followed by the pound sign. Don't forget, the church that prays together stays together. We have provided several methods to pay your tithes and offerings on Sundays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays via PayPal, Cash App, or just call the office and the transaction can be completed over the phone. Our prayer focus for the week is Kayla DeShazo and Cameron Saunders. Let's extend our hands to them and say, My sister and my brother, we are praying for you this week and always in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading for the week is Deuteronomy chapter 18 and Mark chapter 1. Please remember to submit all announcements in writing via email to sean.bolton at gmail.com by Thursday at 5 o'clock p.m. in order to be presented during Sunday services and rebroadcast all week long on our website at www.citadelfaith.net. Now we would like to recognize and say happy birthday to our January babies. Annette Grace, January 1st. Elder Anita Dye, January 11th. Sharon Howard, January 11th. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., January 15th. Brother Mark Friday, January 15th. Natona Savage, January 19th. Elder Joyce Lucky, January 26th. Cameron Saunders, January 26th. Benita Tillich, January 27th. Delroy Tillich, January 28th. Lyric Sui, January 28th. Dwight Dye, January 30th. Jeremiah Wilson, January 30th. Citadel, let's congratulate our January birthdays. Now, on behalf of Bishop Jackson and Superintendent Dr. Pamela S. Jackson, I would like to welcome all of our wonderful visiting friends. Thank you for sharing with us in worship, and consider yourself one of the family whenever you cross our threshold. Grace and peace multiply.
Come on, Citadel, worship with us this morning. Hallelujah. You know how we do it. Let's worship. Let's worship. Come on, put your hands together. Wherever you are, get up off your feet this morning and come with us and join in worship. Come on. Press in his presence this morning. Hallelujah. It's a good time to press. Hallelujah, God, we bless your name.
Good morning, saints, and welcome to Fifth Sunday at Citadel of Faith Christian Fellowship. I greet you today with a Psalms 118 blessing. So verse 24, it says, The stone rejected by the builders has now become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So wherever you are today, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For truly this is the Lord's doing. At this time, Superintendent Dr. Pamela Jackson will come to lead us further into our day of worship. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Citadel. We pray wherever you are that you are blessed because this is a great day. Why is it a great day? Because the sun is shining. See, we are hung up on what's going on in the physical world. It may be raining on the outside in the physical world, but how many know that the sun is shining in the spiritual world? How do I know? Because he is shining in me and he is shining in you. And I bless God for that. So wherever you are, hallelujah, stand to your feet wherever you are and give God a shout out. Give God a praise. Give God a thank you, Jesus. Give God a, he let you see another day and he has blessed you. And that is a good thing. We thank Dr. Sheila Gorm for our Thursday uh, School of Discipleship. And our scripture lesson is going to be very short that comes from this pericope because we are in John in School of Discipleship. And I think this is so fitting for us to understand during a time where it seems that there is a lot of darkness going on. So John was an apostle of Jesus Christ and John often referred himself to the beloved one. He didn't call his name because he knew where he stood with his father. Amen and amen. So get your Bibles. We're going to come this morning out of John 1. And we're going to start in verse 1. And it says, In the beginning was the Word already existed. He was with God and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. He created everything there is. Nothing exists that he didn't make. Life itself was in him, and this life gives light to everyone. The light shines through the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Aren't you happy about this morning that this light that we're talking about, the darkness can never extinguish it? Amen and amen. Now we're going to ask you to prepare your hearts for prayer because we've already been given some good news. Even though there's darkness all around us and it seems like there, there is no way out. The scripture told us in the beginning, he was in the beginning. So he already knew what was going to happen in 20 and 21. He already knew it because he existed in the beginning. And then scripture says everything that exists was in him. So if it was in him, he has not fallen off the throne. He already has it. So now he said, cast your cares upon who? Not the government, not your mama, not your daddy, not the bishop, not the pastor, not the preacher, but upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for us and he is well able. He is well able to hear our cry and answer our prayers. So this morning, make your petitions and your supplications known unto him as we go to the throne of grace. Father God, we bless you this morning. Father God, we pause right now. If we've gotten up this morning, God, and we have failed to say thank you, if we, said, if we have failed to just bless you, if we failed to just acknowledge, Lord God, who you are, we pause right now to say, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were in the beginning, God, and everything that is exists in you. 
So God, we are so grateful this morning that you have the whole world in your hand. We are so grateful this morning, God, that you have the antidote to every problem. We thank you right now, Lord God, that you are the answer to every problem. So when I do not know where to run, God, I thank you that I can run to the rock, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that you are our strength, you are our hope, you are our savior, and you are our redeemer. So God, we come to you boldly this morning, Lord God, first giving thanks for the things that you've already done. Things, God, that we fail to even bless you for, Lord God, because we take it for granted. Forgive us, oh Lord, for those things, for not saying thank you, God, for those things that you constantly give us every day. Yes, that breath we just took, God, we say thank you. Being able to see and being able to walk and being able to breathe without a ventilator this morning, God, I say thank you, Lord Jesus. Because there are some this morning right now, God, on the ventilator, Lord God, that will not be here this time tomorrow, God. So, God, we are grateful because we still have breath. We are grateful, God, that you let us see another day. And so, God, for that, we say thank you. And, God, for those that have, Lord God, transitioned on in the family, Lord God, is feeling heartbroken this morning. Over 410,000 Americans alone, not counting those all around the world. Hearts grieve, God, because you yourself felt it, God, when your friend Lazarus, God, scripture told us that you wept because you would know what it felt like to be part of a community. So today, Lord God, have mercy on the families, Lord God, that has lost loved ones due to COVID, but also have mercy on those that have lost loved ones, whatever that case may be. Alzheimer's is ugly. Cancer is ugly. I know I have witnessed it personally and up close. So God have mercy on those families today that is trying to make ends meet out of little bit, God. But with you, it is so much, God, if we give it to you. So today we cast our cares upon you, God, because you're well able. So, God, lift up our heads, Lord God. Lift us up from our weariness. Lift us up out of darkness. Lift us up out of despair. And, God, continue, Lord God, just to bless this nation, Lord God. Have mercy on this nation, God. Have mercy on the administration, God. Have mercy on, Lord God, local governments and, Lord God, local administration and teachers, God. When I look, Lord God, parents are fussing with teachers and teachers are fussing with superintendents and superintendents are fussing with governors, God, because they don't see the way. But God, you are the way. You are the truth and you are the life and you have the answer. So for every child that's struggling right now, Lord God, trying to have class on Zoom and don't have internet and don't have the best equipment, God, you are the best equipment. So, God, have mercy on those families, Lord God, that don't know what to do. Have mercy on families, Lord God, that have lost jobs. Each day I sit home and I work from home and I feel grateful because not one paycheck has stopped, God, through this COVID. And it's not by my goodness. It's not because I'm so smart. It's because in the beginning you already had it planned. And for that I am grateful. I'm grateful that all my children are well and my children's children are well. I do not take that for granted. I'm grateful that Bishop is well and healthy and still striving, Lord God, holding up the bloodstained batter, God, and running, Lord God, the course that you have given him. So today, continue to bless him and strengthen him and keep him, Lord God, in sound mind and body. As we continue to move, Lord God, for the word, there is a word in the house, so bless the bishop afresh, Lord God, that he will come boldly to the throne, that, Lord God, you will stir gifts up in him that he didn't even know he had, and, God, the gifts that he's already exercised, you would ignite and put on fire, that we would not continue to have church just like it's mediocre, and that we just get up on Sundays and click a button and then click it off and go on about our way. I refuse that and I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. 
We will enter in to worship. We will enter in to praise. I come in to magnify the Lord. This is the day that you have made, Lord God, and I will bless your name in it with whatever apparatus that I have to do it in. I will give you glory. I will give you praise. I will not complain, God, that we are not in the building. Because I am the building, God. I am the church. And I come to worship you. I come to adore you. And I come to magnify your name. So those that have breath today, lift up the name of Jesus wherever you are. And God, we will be careful to give you the praise. We will be careful to say that it is Jesus the Christ, just like John did and John the Baptist did. John said, it is not about me, but it's about Jesus. So today, God, it's all about you. And every day, it's all about you. And we thank you, Lord God, for your goodness. And we thank you, Lord God, for your mercy. So continue to bless us and keep us, Lord God, with our minds stayed on thee. You said that is when we will have perfect peace. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we do decree and declare that all is well. Come on, Citadel. All is well. All is well. Come on. All is well concerning me. And it is so. Amen. I'm so happy to now bring forth the word from God, from our bishop's lips, to our ears. Come on, have a heart to receive. Put your hands together for none other than Bishop Dr. George B. Jackson, CMI, presiding prelate, and Citadel of Faith, pastor and good shepherd. Amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoke, so let the, the church, church say amen. You know, we often sing that song at the conclusion of a sermon or at the conclusion of worship service. But God has spoken so brilliantly and passionately through his woman servant in prayer this morning to lift our hearts and encourage us. I felt compelled before the sermon to say amen. amen. We agree and we are in one accord with what was shared with you today. Well, today, my friends, I want to uh, encourage your hearts and speak to your psyche and lift your heads during this long, dark winter. It seems that the winter has an emotional effect on so many people, an effect that causes introverts to even go further in, an effect that causes those who are uh, low in heart and who are faint in heart to grow even more despondent. And so this is a time when people get, for lack of a better term, depressed and begin to feel like they have no way out of these dark situations. And so I, it's incumbent upon me to share with you, I hope today, a message that will give you something to rejoice about. Amen. And I want to invite your attention to Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Romans chapter 8, verses 14, 15, and 16. Romans chapter 8, verses 14, 15, and 16 from the King James Version. Romans 8, I want you to get your Bibles today. I want you to follow along, along with me carefully. I'm gonna share uh, some important scriptures. All scriptures important, but impactful scriptures for this particular message. Romans chapter eight, verses 14 through 16. Today from the King James Version. The apostle writes, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, 
They are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen. Let me re-emphasize uh -huh. verse 16 for you. The spirit itself, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Numa, the paraclete, bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. We are happy to receive it by saying thanks be to God. Thanks, now, my friends, I would like for you to just examine this world we live in. <clears throat> and we can't help but uh, examine it because it's always in our face. Everywhere we turn, we are confronted with the fact that we live in a tumultuous world. Our day-to-day -day existence seems to be dominated by mayhem and mishap locally, nationally, and internationally. It's hard to keep up with all the events that impact our world in a 24-hour period. A deposed defrocked, defeated former president continues even to this day to promote a hideous, twisted lie. A lie that creates tensions that strain the fabric of our nation to the point of insurrection, sedition, white privilege, and even treason. We are in the midst of a vicious pandemic, a pandemic that has, as of this morning, infected 25.8 million people in the United States. And it has destroyed, as of last night, 435,000 lives in less than a year. Our economy that was strong at the end of 2016 today is in a shambles. Unemployment that had dipped below 4% for the first time since, since World War II's end is now hovering at 6.5%. People in our communities, not on the other side of the country or in third world countries, but in our local communities are lining up to receive boxes of food just to make it through to the end of the week. Our children are living lives unstable as they try to figure out if they're on Schedule A or Schedule B or Schedule C, if they go to the classroom this week, or if they will continue to be confined to their bedrooms and dens and even closets to work on their school. Gasoline prices, I've noticed recently, mm -hmm. they go, they're going back up. And it seems like they go up and down on a roller coaster every day. Yet, a decent minimum wage to pay for this much needed commodity is out of the question for most political figures who can't seem to understand why poor people can't make it on $7.25 an hour. It's a lot to swallow, isn't it? It's a lot to comprehend in the midst of trying to manage our personal affairs 
and our individual dilemmas. Who can keep up? In the wake of our consternation and continuous distractions, God is <clears throat> God is clearing his throat. <laughs> God is trying to get a word in edgewise. In the quagmire of our scandals and controversies, <clears throat> excuse me, the Lord is speaking to us today through his logos. So before you get too stressed out on the negatives that are facing you, I want you to know that there are 10 things that God wants you to remember. 10 things that God wants you to remember. First of all, he wants you to remember, I love you. Say that to the sky. I love you. I love you. It's no small affair that God loves us. His love for us did not just recently surface. He didn't start loving us after we gave our lives to him. God loved us from the foundation of the world. Before we were thought of, before we were even an idea or concept, God loved us. Our father told Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, mm. I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, listen, he said, I sanctify. <laughs> Jeremiah 1, 5 and 6. 156, rather. Now, friends, this is significant in that many of us, quite frankly and honestly, were hard to love. Amen, somebody. Amen. <laughs> Some of us are not very lovable, yet God loves us anyway. This is what the Greeks call agape, or unconditional love. This love is transparent in John 3, 16, when Jesus told Nicodemus late one night, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, and I'm glad that I'm a part of whosoever, believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Secondly, God wants you to know that I will bless you. Say that out loud. I will bless you. Jesus said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before them. Matthew 5, 11 and 12. In other words, you are Makairos. Let's say that together. Makairos. You're not lucky. Like a lottery winner. Or charmed. Like a witch or warlock. Not just the temporary state called happy. But you are Makairos. In other words, you are content. Contentment equates to satisfaction. So even when I'm broke, even when I'm hurt, and even when I'm catching hell on the job, and even when I'm in a financial crisis, even when I'm broke, busted, and disgusted, I'm content. I'm content because I'm blessed of the Lord on a permanent basis. I'm expanded, I'm extended, and I have an expected end. 
The third thing that God wants you to know is I will protect you. Let's just remind yourself, God will protect me. A security system in your home will warn you of the intrusion of unwanted persons into your residence. A smoke detector will warn you of the possibility of fire in your home. A Glock under your bed will provide an arsenal against an attack by one or more persons. But just remember that bullets run out. Jesus. And you have to reload after the gun is empty. Systems fail. And if your security system will not be at its most potent if your telephone has been disconnected. Guns that you might rely on will misfire and jam. Smoke detectors sometimes emit false signals. But God provides divine protection. Protection that is not subject to the miscalculations of a flawed world. I believe it was David who wrote, for in the time of trouble, and believe me, my friends, we are living in some troubled times, but in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and he shall set me Upon a rock. Psalms 27 and 5. The fourth thing that we need to remember is that God will give you rest. God will give you rest. The worries of this world that we live in and pass through, they tend to wear us out. The need to be two or Three places at one time to be here, there, and everywhere, that can leave us feeling pulled and pushed and stretched to our wit's end. <clears throat> this overload of burdens often results in depression, weariness, and sadness. But God wants to give us rest. A rest that will replenish, revive, and refresh us. God told the children of Israel in Exodus 33 and 14, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. God's rest for us is not on the couch. It's not at the spa. Nor is it on a summer vacation. He gives us spiritual rest. Rest for our souls in green pastures where our spirit man can be restored. Jesus told the multitudes that were following him in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest for your soul. The fifth thing that God wants you to know is that God will be with you. God will be with you. Many of us began to feel like we are all alone. Ever had that feeling of solitude? 
That's particularly when we lose a loved one to death, distance, or unforeseen circumstance. Some people get so fearful, isolated, and disconnected from everyone else, which is where the devil wants you to be, that they feel like they are all alone in this great big world. It's a ploy of the adversary. You see, God reminds us that we are not alone in this world. Solomon told the children of Israel in 1 Kings 8 and 57, the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us or forsake us. My friends, I have a real sense of companionship when I'm reminded that Jesus said out of his own mouth in Matthew 28 and 20, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He told his disciples in John 14 and 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. He sent his Holy Spirit. He sent his presence to be a shoulder that we could lean on. He sent his pneuma to fill us up when we would feel empty. He sent his paraclete to help us when we feel helpless. He promised to be with us. The sixth thing that God wants you to know is that God will deliver you. Remind yourself of that right now where you are. God will deliver me. God will deliver me. You know, many of us have gotten into trouble and tried to fix the situation or solve the problem with our own human ingenuity. We've tried to self-medicate. We've tried to self-improve. We've tried to conquer the problem alone. It seemed that the more we did to solve the problem, the deeper the hole became. The more we have done to try to work it out ourselves, we have many times made the problem greater. The more we do to take matters in our own hands, the dirtier our hands become. We look for family, friends, and agencies to bail us out. But so often, others see our calamity as an opportunity to profit or get ahead at our expense. It seems that our failures becomes our enemy's fuel. Mm. The three Hebrew, Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, <laughs> knew something about getting into deep trouble. <laughs> they knew how to deal with a heated situation. When it got hot, they called on the deliverer. They told Nebuchadnezzar, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will, mm. not he may, Amen. not he might, Amen. not he could, but they said, he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Yes. Daniel 3 and 17. The seventh thing that God wants you to know is that God will provide for you. Remind yourself, God will provide for me. 
You know, sometimes we don't know where the next meal is coming from. Many of us, like it or not, seem to be living from paycheck to paycheck. And we often run out in between. I believe that there are some folks who can admit that their bills are bigger than their budget. And if we would be honest, we are constantly making personal sacrifices just to get by. How often have I even heard myself say, mm. I'm just trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Mm. Sometimes I end up robbing Peter to pay Paul, pinching off here and pulling there just to cover up the bleeding economic crisis that I find myself in. A songwriter once said, I almost gave up, mm. but God kept me mm. so I wouldn't let go. Amen. <laughs> the psalmist declared in Psalms 94 and 17, unless the Lord had been with me, my soul, would have dwelt in silence. Isaac will tell you that God will make provision for you. His father Abraham was about to slay him for a sacrifice unto the Lord. Abraham told young Isaac, my God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Not for you, but will provide it for himself because his name and his reputation and integrity is unquestionable. So if a sacrifice is needed in your life, he will provide. Before Abraham could take Isaac's young life on Mount Moriah, God sent a ram, caught him up in a bush where he couldn't escape. No wonder Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh, for God will provide. The eighth thing that God wants you to know God wants you to know that he will fight for you. You ought to declare to the adversaries, seen and unseen, God will fight for me. I know some of us are tough. Some of us have scars on our bodies and on our souls from battles that we have waged against countless foes. We have scar tissue to remind us how big and bad we think we are. We have been in mortal combat with adversaries, seen and unseen, real and imaginable. And this Rambo mentality leaves many of us wounded, paranoid, and disfigured. Some of us are walking around with post-traumatic stress disorder and we don't even know it. Uh -huh. That's why we snap at people who are trying to help us. Uh -huh. That's why we run hot at the drop of a dime. That's why we get offended at the slightest change. That's why we fly off the handle if someone challenges us. That's why we go through life in panic mode, thinking somebody is out to get us, not realizing that we're not nearly as important <laughs> as we think we are. Come on. God wants us to lay down our weapons 
and let him fight for us. He wants us to trust him enough to let him deal with our <coughs> enemies. Come on. When the armies rise against us, God wants us to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When the enemy surrounds us, remember what he told his only begotten son through the pen of David. He said, sit thou at my right hand while I make thine enemies thy footstool. So you don't have to respond to every salacious rumor. You don't have to debate every damn lie or challenge every gossip. Hold your peace and let the Lord fight your battle. The prophet Jezreel told Judah, Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle Jesus. is not yours. Let me say that again Amen. for those of you who like to fight. The <laughs> battle is not yours. Let me reiterate this Hallelujah. to those of you who might feel a bully spirit rising up in you. The battle is not yours. It is God's. Second Chronicles 20 and 15. The ninth thing that God wants you to know, he will be your strength. <laughs> yes, yes. Tell that weak spot in your life, God will be my strength. I might feel strong today and think I have enough strength to carry my multitude of burdens on my shoulders alone. But in reality, I just can't do it. I'm going to be transparent. I just got to come out front and tell you I can't carry all this by myself. It seems like one more issue one more problem, one more breaking news story, one more mishap, and I will break down and collapse under the pressure that I have, get this, heaped upon myself. I'm so glad that my God is able to hold me up in the middle of the battle he sends angels on my left hand and my right hand to keep my arms up so that I can reign against my enemies. He's holding me up. When I'm weak, I'm reminded that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Amen. God is a never-ending source of power. He never tires. He never experiences fatigue. We can't get on his nerves. <laughs> In Job's weakest hour, Job was compelled to say in, in chapter 9, verse 19, if I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. I know that my personal inadequacies might portray me as a deficient being. But God told the Hebrews returning from their exile in Job 3 and 10, let the weak say, I am strong. Now, that may uh, confuse some of us because it seems like he's telling the weak to say that they are personally strong, but the word says, let the weak say, I am. <laughs> That's good. And I am is not who we are. I am is who he is. For he told Moses, 
who just didn't want to go and confront Pharaoh. He didn't want to go and deal with the children of Israel because some of them were still murmuring about how he killed the Egyptian. Moses came up with an excuse. Well, the people won't know who actually is sending me. Who shall I say sent me to let them go? God said, tell them that I am, that I am have sent you. So in our weakness, let the weak say, I am strong. He is strong. He is able. And my friends, it's not a reflection of failure. Mm -hmm. When you let God bear your love. Amen. You know, some of us, we play that role, that image that we are invincible. And we think that that's impressive to people. But my friends, your invincibility is just a temporary status anyway. But when we let people know that it is God who is doing it, God who's carrying us, God who's keeping us, God who's delivering us, that's really impressive. When we let go and say, I failed. But God, I came short, but God, I messed up, but God, I should be gone, but God, I should be walking the streets with nowhere to lay my head, but God, that's a sign. It's a sign of our acknowledging his sovereignty and omnipotence. When we turn it over to God, don't let the devil make you feel meager. Don't let him make you feel like a dust bag. Nehemiah 8 and 10 says, neither be ye sorry for the joy of the Lord mm -hmm. is your strength. Hallelujah. The tenth and final thing that God wants you to know is that he will not fail you. Hallelujah. Tell yourself, God will not fail me. Man's failures are insurmountable. Nuclear power plants leak coal ash waste into our river basin. Genetic engineers miscalculate birth defects and abnormalities. Disease outbreaks are unforeseen. Economies falter into recession. Cell phones drop calls. Transplanted organs are rejected. Fat, even after liposuction, comes back. Implants that puff you up and make you look voluptuous <laughs> leak and cause deadly infection. Mm -hmm. Cars run out of gas. Mm -hmm. You can see the finest cars in America sometimes on the side of the road. Trains jump the track. Planes with so much technology packed into them still fall out of the skies and crash. Ships wreck. And in, even in our own lifetimes, space shows have exploded in midair. Checks bounce. Credit cards max out. Even computers catch viruses and crash. Man stumbles and falls on his face time and time again. He fails and comes up short. Man will let you down, but God will never fail you. And I'm so glad that God, unlike me, won't go back on his word. His word is his bond. Amen. 
He holds his word even high above his head. How often have we depended on somebody to do something and they didn't come through? How often have we waited on someone to come by and see about us? And they never showed up. God ordained me to tell you today that when family and friends disappoint you, he will never fail you. He will not forsake you. For God is our refuge and our strength. The psalmist writes that he's a very present help in trouble. And unlike man who will look you in the eye and lie to your face, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Friends would tell you that the task is too difficult or the problem is too hard to solve. When you are faced with roadblocks and, and critics on left and right hand, Remember that God, what God asked Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 32 and 27, God said, Behold, I am the Lord thy God, the God of all flesh. Is there anything, hallelujah, too hard for me? After God delivered Job from utter defeat, Job said, Lord, I know that thou can do everything. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 19 and 26, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. God is never late like us. He shows up in Kairos. Not only will he show up, God will show up and show out and even show from day to day his salvation. And so because we are God's daughters and sons, we are obliged to remember and not forget how much Yahweh loves us. We have been redeemed today by the saving blood of Jesus the Christ through whom we have been perfectly adopted by the Father. We are no longer aliens or strangers or bastards, but we are heirs and even joint heirs with the Son who has freed us from the bondage of fear. Paul told Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, Amen. but of power and of love and of a sound mind. For the Spirit bears witness, whom the Son makes free is free indeed. So remember the day who delivered you. Remember who keeps you. Remember who provides for you. Remember that it is of his mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Remember who loves you. Remember who was tried for you. Remember who bore your stripes. Remember who hung up high and stretched out wide for you. Remember who bled and died for you. Remember who lay in your grave so you wouldn't have to. Remember who rose from the dead on the third day morning with all power in his hands. Remember who sits on the right hand of God in power, interceding, on your behalf, even at this very moment, remember that God loves you. Amen. 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 Grace and peace. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of these 10 things, 10 things he wants us to remember. When you go to feeling sad for yourself, Replay this message and remember these 10 things. When you're just about to give up, rewind this video and remember these 10 things that 
God wants you to know. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you one and all. Now, my friends, whoever you are, if you have not accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, I pray that this message somehow reached you in that dark, cold place in your heart and that you might open up your heart. You said, Behold, I knock at the door. If any man open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. And he with me. If you open your heart today and let him into that place, he'll save you. He'll deliver you. He'll set you free. For the word says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And you can be free in him if you will accept him as your personal Savior. Amen. God bless you. At this time, we want to invite you to share in the act of giving. As the Lord has blessed you, the Lord has prospered you, as the Lord has showered down blessings on you. And we close out this initial month of the year, January, coming to a conclusion. I want to challenge you to give a liberal offering, to give a generous donation, to step out of your comfort zone and give even more than you had planned to. For many times, we have minimized the impact of our blessing because we have minimized the generosity of our offering. And our offerings are our way of saluting God and our way of obeying his command. It says, give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Some people are holding your blessing. Some people are holding your financial windfall because you're holding back in your generosity to God. So today, you can be a blessing even unto the kingdom by means of uh, cash app, dollar sign, Citadel of Faith, you can give through PayPal. Go to our website, citadelloffaith.net, and click on the donation button, and you'll see several ways that you can give in that capacity. You can give uh, by means of calling our office, even right now. Our administrator, Miranda Bolton, is on standby to receive your call. And there's no time better than right now. I know you might be saying, I'm going to do it later. But wait till later. Now is the time. While it's on your heart and the, the uh, appeal is being made, don't delay your blessing. You, you need this blessing right now. So you can call our office at 336-476-7218. That's 336-476-7218. And you can give by means of your debit card or credit card right there over the phone. Our mailing address is 108 Salem Street, Thomasville, North Carolina, 27360. That's Citadel of Faith, 108 Salem Street, Thomasville, North Carolina, 27360. You can give, and there's so many means in, in, in different ways because of technology, because of these electronic vibes that you can give and send your safe payment. Uh, there'll be uh, no hacking this system. Your payments are safe as you give to the church. Thank you so much for being a part of uh, our ministry this month. And let me remind those of you who have not on this last day of the month, if you haven't given your $21 offering, why $21? because we're going into, we're into the 21st year of the 20th century, and we're starting off with a sacrificial offering in the month of January, and that sacrificial offering is $21. If you haven't given your $21 in the month of January today, it's the last day of the month, the last day for you to give that uh, sacrificial offering of $21. So please, everyone, uh, even if you're not a member of our church, you're not a part of Citadel of Faith, 
you're part of our ministry today. Please remember your sacrificial offering. It's a way to start the year off focused on being productive, prosperous, and plentiful, and making a commitment through sacrifice to have that productive year, $21 for the 21st year. Join us, my friends, on Wednesday for our midweek service. Our preacher this week is my own wonderful, lovely wife, Superintendent Dr. Pamela Jackson. She's gonna bring a mighty powerful word on this Wednesday. So that will be followed on Thursday by our School of Discipleship, our Sunday School Hour on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. Uh, that's led this week by Deacon Stuart Bambi, and uh, he's teamed up with uh, Deacon Sheila Gorham in leading our uh, School of Discipleship on Thursday evenings. Please remember, those of you who are interested in expanding your knowledge and, and really empowering your ministry, uh, we ask that you would enroll in our university and that's United Cornerstone University. Classes start for the winter session on Saturday, February 6th. All of our classes this session, and we have four classes, all of our classes are online. There are no in-house classes due to the lingering virus. I'm praying also that as many of you as possible will get your uh, vaccination, get your shot. I know there's a lot of... Um, whacked out people who are saying, I'm not taking that virus, I'm not get, I'm not taking that shot. Well, there'll be a whole lot of people who survive and walk around, and then the folks who are dying, you check their record, they wouldn't have taken the shot. So when the shot's available to me, I'm gonna take the shot, because I'd rather be in the living group than in the dying group, amen. So we look forward to seeing you um, next week, I look forward to seeing you in class. You can, if you're interested in uh, classes at United Cornerstone University, uh, you can call our office at 336-476-7218. I've taken up enough of your time today. I've enjoyed being with you. I thank God for my worship leader, uh, Dr. Pamela Jackson, and thank God for all of you tuning in today to Citadel Ministries. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, be with you, one and all. And the church said, Amen. Amen.